Okay. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, we are very pleased to have a uh, 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 guest today, uh, Dan Jacobs, for our Maine Woodland Owners Virtual uh, Forestry Information Session. Um, Dan is a district forester in the northern part of the state, and he is actually become a regular contributor to our newsletter, Maine Woodlands. He's been providing some very practical, um, hands-on information about management and improvements on forest land. But I think his real um, love is talking to people about how they can enjoy their land, not just improve it, but actually get into the woods and just find the, the beauty and the fun of being in your woods. And his love that has produced, has helped produce a manual that the Maine Forest Service has now um, published and is made available to anyone who's interested in having it. It's called The Woods in Your Backyard. And it's a book of activities that can be used both as an, by yourself or with a group or with a family. And it's just a way to further engage woodland owners and their, uh, with their woods in a way that is meaningful and um, helps you learn about what you have and what the uh, opportunities are to um, enjoy them. So um, Maine Woodland Owners is an organization that's been around since 1975. We have um, a very um, wonderful member uh, members uh, program where we have some terrific people who are involved in our organization. Um, a lot of times they're part of our organization because they own woods and they need uh, to know that they have expertise and information available to them when they need it. We produce a monthly newsletter and we have a resource website where you can find a lot of the information that you might be looking for. So hopefully everybody's a member here. If not, please uh, check out our membership page on our website, www.mainwoodlandowners.org. And um, I'm just thrilled to have Dan here today. He's also a chapter leader for our organization. We have 10 chapters and chapter leaders are in charge of putting together some programs for uh, some local programs so we can ensure that we have programming available in the field uh, in all parts of the state. So he's part of our northern Maine chapter. So Dan, please fill in the gaps of things I didn't uh, include in my introduction to you. But again, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll just say one more thing that um, Dan, I'm sure would be happy to uh, answer questions as he's doing his presentation. I will be keeping an eye out for people who are maybe sending along questions in the chat box. Or if you would like my attention, you can turn on your video and uh, raise your hand and I'll be looking out for you to make sure I catch your hand and I can call on you and you can go ahead and answer your question, ask your question and, and Dan will respond. And then finally, at the end, he's going to create some time at the end to for people to ask questions. So lots of opportunity to engage. Dan, I'm assuming you'd be very happy to have people ask questions. I think that probably always helps presenters know that they're they're pro providing the information people are looking for. And he's going to provide all the information you need to know about what's in this manual uh, in the in the pub publication and also how you can get your hands on it, which is something I'm working on as well. I haven't gotten my copy yet. So I'm looking forward to coming through it. I've just seen the PDF version on the website. So um, without any further ado, thank you everybody for letting us know where, where you're calling from. It's great to see so many people from different parts of the state. And we do have an out-of-stater from Connecticut. So Jan, wow. you're, out of state, you're our out-of-state representative today. So thanks for joining us. Okay, Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for having me and thank you everybody for participating in this uh, workshop and presentation. I'm gonna try to show my screen. Go ahead and, and uh, try, I forgot to uh, give you that permission. I've given it to you now. Okay, we'll see if the technology works. Okay, let's see. Sounds like some people need to mute though. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, we need everyone to mute. So we don't have too many, um, to any noises. Thank you. Great. All right. So, 
I'm having a little bit of a glitch with turning this into presentation view. Can you guys see the presentation right now? <laughs> yep. Okay. So um, do you, if you click on slideshow, uh, does that do anything for you? Yeah, for some reason, the, um, the Zoom toolbar is in the way of that. Yes. You can do it at the bottom right there, as well. Right there, click. The screen. Okay, yeah. to the, all the way to the left. There you go. All right. I think you got so, it. Good. Uh, so this afternoon, I'm going to do a short presentation on the publication, The Woods in Your Backyard. Uh, this is a second edition of a book uh, originally published by the Forest Service in 1999. Uh, it's always been a very popular book. Uh, and we came out with the second edition primarily because the original was getting a bit out of date and we had completely run out of copies. Uh, so this presentation will take uh, maybe a half an hour depending on questions and then I'll stick around if folks have more questions when the presentation is over. Uh, these are the topics I'm going to discuss concerning the book. Uh, we'll, I'll go into just a little bit of the background of the publication, uh, the audience that the uh, Woods in Your Backyard is geared towards. I'll talk about the uh, people that contributed to the publication. Uh, I'll talk about the parts of the book and how to use the book. Uh, Towards the end, I will discuss how you can go about getting a copy of the book or reading it online. And of course, as I said, uh, we'll have some time for questions if you have any. So I'll start off just with a brief overview of the Forest Service, what I consider the premier publications. Uh, and these are all available on our website and I'll give you that address at the end of the presentation. Uh, of course, the woods in your backyard is front and center on this slide. That's mostly what I'm going to be speaking about today. Uh, but just to give you a little bit of information on the others, uh, starting uh, in the upper left and going counterclockwise, you can see what will my woods look like. This is a, a relatively new publication designed for landowners to help them understand uh, what different types of forestry treatments and harvesting uh, will look like. And it helps landowners know what to expect when they're working with a forester and a logger and doing management on their property. Uh, this has been a pretty popular publication. I think it came out maybe two or three years ago. Uh, then uh, down one in the lower left-hand side is the Forest Trees of Maine. This is probably our most recognizable publication. Um, there's many, many, many copies of this out in the world because this has been published since 1908. Uh, initially, it was published to give out copies to school children, and now we distribute it to all sorts of different people. Uh, including school children and small woodlot owners. Uh, this is the best free tree identification book you will ever get for the state of Maine. Uh, so it's a really good deal. I remember back when there was a Borders bookstore in Bangor, uh, which is quite some time ago now, but they were selling these books for $15 a copy. And uh, we were we were, I'd say selling, but we were charging $7 or so a piece for them. So they were marking them up quite a bit. Uh, the next publication, uh, lower right-hand side is what I call our BMP manual. And this is a great resource for loggers, landowners, and foresters. And it, it is a great guide to protecting water quality when you're doing uh, logging operations. So that's been a very popular guide uh, for the past 15 or so years that it's been in print. Uh, the last publication I'll give an overview on is the Forestry Rules of Maine. Uh, this is a, a pretty important publication because the rules in Maine for forest practices are, are pretty complex, uh, ranging from the rules for protecting water quality to the size of clear cuts you can do. Uh, 
So there's a lot of rules, they're complex, and this puts all the rules in one place and it uh, gives descriptions of the rules in an easy to read format. Uh, so this is sort of a pretty important book and a lot of foresters and loggers utilize that on a regular basis. So now we'll get into the, the real top woods in your backyard. Uh, as I mentioned, this book was first published in 1999. Uh, it was super popular when it first came out. Uh, we ended up running out of copies eventually. Uh, I think there may still be a version of it electronically on our website. Um, and it was a great book at the time, uh, but that's 22 years old now. And so there was a material in there that was out of date, uh, especially things like uh, website links and links to different publications. Uh, a lot of that needed to be completely revamped. Uh, so when we decided to go in and do the update, we made quite a few changes. Uh, we still tried to keep the core audience the same and the core messages the same, uh, but a lot of the content changed uh, and the format changed a little bit. And we think um, the, the new publication for uh, this time period is great. Um, I mean, I think we, we did a lot of nice upgrades to it and it's a good publication. Uh, so who should read this book? Well, the initial book was geared towards the very small landowner, uh, folks with a little bit of woods in their backyard and people that didn't know a whole lot about the forest or forestry. Uh, we kind of had that in the back of our head when we revamped the book and came out with the second edition, but we kind of broadened the audience a bit. And uh, of course, this is still a great publication for the very small landowner with just a couple acres, uh, but it's good for woodland owners of all sizes. Uh, it's great for camp owners and homeowners with a little patch of woods. Uh, teachers and students may find this useful because uh, a lot of the activities that I'm going to talk about are, uh, they follow sort of the project learning tree format that teachers have used for many years. Uh, and anyone with any interest in the outdoors will find some use for this book or should uh, because there's things in there like orienteering with a compass that any outdoors person is going to need. Uh, so uh, kind of a broad audience, but the focus still is really the, the core audience is still the small landowner uh, with not a lot of knowledge about forestry. Uh, so why should you read The Woods in Your Backyard? Um, basically to get a general understanding of the Maine woods. It provides a great overview of the forests of Maine. Uh, and the features in the forests of Maine. Uh, there's a variety of different project ideas and I have project ideas in red because I'll talk a little bit about that in my next slide. Uh, and there's also a number of educational activities which I'll talk about in detail towards the end of this presentation. Uh, we have a great uh, glossary in the book to help understand the a terminology that we use. And I don't want people to get uh, scared if they're not um, tuned into forestry just yet, because we don't use a lot of technical terms in the book. Um, we tried to keep it uh, fairly simple and easy to understand. Uh, but when we do use a technical term, it's in bold and uh, it can be found in the glossary. Throughout the book, there's tips and links to get additional assistance, uh, assistance from other agencies, from other organizations, uh, and links to different publications that can, can help you out with particular topics. Uh, but in general, this book should help the user to uh, improve their woodlot with the different project ideas and also help the user enjoy their woodlot or woodland. Uh, I will add one thing I didn't put in here in the presentation uh, that I should have spoke about in a previous slide is that we do have a list of all our premier publications uh, within the first few pages of the book. And if you have a smartphone, 
uh, those have QR codes next to them. So you can uh, use a QR code reader with your smartphone and get that publication to come up uh, instantly on your phone. So just kind of a neat feature that we've started to put in all of our publications. <clears throat> so again, I said there was a project ideas uh, that I discussed. That was the item that was in red in the last slide. Just an example of one of the project ideas is uh, uh, building a wildlife blind. And within that little section of the book, building a wildlife blind with view for uh, viewing or for photography, um, there's suggested locations uh, for these blinds and for viewing wildlife. Uh, the section also has tips on the different types of blinds and the different construction methods. And there's also a link to a pretty good article from Maine Audubon about uh, wildlife wildlife lines. Uh, so that, that little uh, section or project uh, takes up a couple of paragraphs in the book and you'll find those types of projects scattered throughout the book in different sections. I wanna talk briefly about the folks that worked on the book because I'd like to give a little bit of credit and let you know um, where we got all the information from. Of course, some of the information came from the original 1999 edition, uh, but we added a lot of new content and all new pictures. And that was mostly Maine Forest Service staff, uh, the district foresters, a couple of forest rangers, and we have uh, what I call program coordinators in Augusta uh, that do outreach and uh, urban forestry. Uh, they were very helpful. Uh, the, one person I didn't put on here from the Maine Forest Service that did a huge amount of work is uh, Rondi Doran. Uh, she's the administrative assistant to the director of the Forest Service. And uh, we did all of the work in-house in putting the book together. And she organized all the information that we sent in, um, did a lot of the design, made it look good, uh, made sure that um, we spelled things correctly. So she kind of put all the pieces together for us and she did a ton of work on it. I've got to give uh, Rondi a lot of credit for that. Uh, from outside of the Forest Service, we uh, had Ted Shina supply a bunch of information on uh, timber harvesting and um, timber production for that section of the book. Uh, Ted is a senior operations forester at Cuba Resources. And Ted has always had a big interest in educational programs. And he's helped me out a lot in the past with educational uh, activities and things. Uh, Nancy Olmstead was very helpful. She works for the Maine Natural Areas Program and she's an invasive plant biologist. She helped a lot with, of course, the invasive plant section of the book. She did some proofreading for us, uh, but she supplied some very good content. Uh, Harris Sohal, uh, she works for Maine CDC. She's an epidemiologist and she helped us with um, things like uh, the diseases spread by ticks and mosquitoes, uh, that type of thing. So she was very helpful as well. Uh, and there were others that I probably missed and haven't named here. And uh, I'm sorry if I missed somebody, but uh, we did have a lot of help on this book from a lot of uh, people with diverse backgrounds. These are the six chapters in the book. And um, each chapter is very different from the next. Uh, Knowing Your Woods, I'll just go through these very briefly. Knowing Your Woods is an introduction to the main woods and to forestry. It helps you get uh, a little bit familiar with your property if you're not already familiar with it. Uh, helps you find some basic resources and uh, mapping options for your property. Uh, helps you gather information and sort of get started. Uh, the optimizing non-timber resource chapter, number two, uh, contains things like uh, wildlife habitat management, uh, recreational opportunities. Uh, I believe aesthetics is in there as well. Uh, and also non-timber products. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail. 
Uh, an example would be wreath brush. Uh, chapter three, woodland hazard. Uh, this is where the, our epidemiologist uh, came into play with the uh, information on ticks and uh, mosquitoes and other types of uh, uh, critters that spread pathogens. Uh, but we also have information in there about uh, hazard trees, uh, wildland fire, and a variety of other, other things. I believe that chapter also includes uh, information on how to stay found, not get lost. So that would be where a lot of the orienteering with a compass information is contained. Uh, protecting your woods. Uh, this is a, a very valuable section. Uh, especially and maybe more so in some parts of the state, uh, a big piece of this is invasive insects and invasive plants. And as we all know, uh, invasive insects and plants have become a pretty big problem in the state of Maine. Uh, where I am in northern Maine, uh, the plants are, are not as big of an issue as in uh, maybe southern and central Maine. Um, but this there's a great deal of information uh, in this section on uh, those topics. Growing and harvesting timber, uh, that was a section that Ted Shina helped quite a bit with. And uh, of course, it's just like the name implies, it gives information on assessing your property for uh, timber value. There's activities related to uh, timber production. Uh, there's also information on getting in touch with the forester to uh, start the process of doing some management on your property. Um, and then from great ideas to action, planning is the key. That's chapter six. And chapter six uh, is really the chapter that ties everything together because there's a lot of information provided in chapters one through five. And chapter six kind of brings it all together and helps you get started on your path to doing management doing activities on your property and to getting outside and working in your woodland. Uh, so that's that's where you jump from the book to actually doing stuff. Hopefully you've been doing stuff in, in your woods uh, throughout your reading of the entire book, but, but that's really a, a perfect little jumping off point to really get going. Now, here's some special features in the book, and I call these special special features. I don't know, you might not think they're that special, but I like them. Uh, the primary resources, within chapter one, there's a nice little sort of what I call a phone directory of, um, of different organizations and agencies that can provide you help on a whole variety of topics. So the example I use here is there's the contact information for Maine Woodland owners, and there's also a little tiny paragraph about what is Maine Woodland Owners contained uh, in that little directory. So all of the state agencies that can help you uh, with management of your woodland are contained in that directory, the Forest Service, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, uh, Natural Areas Program, uh, but also a variety of nonprofit organizations like uh, uh, Maine Tree Farm and Maine Woodland Owners. Uh, the do you know questions and answers. Uh, this is kind of a cool section that uh, was not in the original publication, but we decided to add it just kind of for fun. Uh, if you've been in Maine for a while, then you may know all the answers right off. If you're new to the state, then this may give you a lot of new information. Uh, so throughout the book, there is one do you know question per chapter, and all the answers to these are found on page 120. And so this is just an example from chapter six, the year of the last log drive down the Kennebec River. Uh, no, nobody should type this in chat because we want you, if you don't know the answer, we want you to get the book to find the answer. Uh, so a, a neat, bunch of uh, little questions on a variety of topics. Uh, the glossary, like I've mentioned before, I think is very helpful. We tried not to use a lot of technical terminology in the book. Sometimes we do have to use that terminology because we need everybody to kind of be speaking the same language. If you're working with a forester or a logger and you're a landowner, uh, we should all have a basic understanding of the language of forestry. 
So um, in this example, I put in snag and the definition of standing dead tree or part of a tree. Snags are important wildlife habitat. So uh, you, you may be, uh, you may not know what that word means, but the definition is pretty uh, clear and simple when you get right down to it. That glossary I think is quite helpful for folks. We'll take a quick look at chapter two, which is optimizing non-timber resources. And within that, there's four, four sections, three sections plus activities. Um, the sections include uh, improving your woods for wildlife, beauty and adventure out your back door, producing specialty products. And we'll talk about that in the next slide or two specifically. And then in this chapter, there's two backyard family activities. And just as a heads up, uh, one of the backyard family activities in this section is making maple taffy, which is pretty simple to do, uh, but it's a pretty fun little family project. Uh, you could do it yourself, but it's probably more fun with friends and family. And it's also a way if you're inclined to support Maine's maple industry and buy some locally made maple syrup. Uh, realistically, you're only looking at purchasing a pint or a quart of syrup to do this project. So not a big expense. And here are the uh, specialty products that we discuss in uh, this chapter. Uh, Christmas tree production. Uh, this is a Christmas tree grower in the Holton, Maine area. He's uh, pruning or shearing Christmas trees. Uh, we have a child collecting sap. Uh, that's one of, that's a forest service employee's uh, child and that's on the university forest. Uh, and then a ranger took a picture of this woman uh, collecting wreath brush or tipping. So all three of those topics are discussed in a little bit of detail. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna give you information on how to in the book, how to grow a few Christmas trees, how to make maple syrup, and how to uh, grow and collect wreath brush. A few little excerpts from the maple syrup section. I'll just read through these quickly. Uh, for New England's earliest settlers, maple sugar was often the most available sweetener. The raw ingredient of pure maple syrup is sap for maple trees. You'd be surprised at how many people don't, don't know that. I do a lot of uh, maple Sunday tours at a local sugar house and in the uh, sugar woods. And um, there are some people that think that there is uh, something added to the syrup to make it uh, a certain color, to give it a certain maple flavor. They don't understand that the only thing that nothing goes into syrup except the sap uh, when you buy uh, pure Maine maple syrup. Uh, three, sap runs in the spring when the nighttime temperature is below freezing and the daytime temperature is above freezing. Uh, and then there's additional resources uh, from the Maine Forest Service and from UMaine Extension. So for those additional resources, the Maine Forest Service has a fact sheet on making maple syrup. So there in the book, there's a link to that fact sheet. Uh, and also UMaine Extension has a maple syrup production information sheet. And there's a link to that as well. So when we say that this is a resource guide, that's sort of what we, we mean is that we give you some basic information to get you going. And then we give you directions on how to get more information and start to become a, a specialist in an area uh, if you want to. Okay, so this is, I forgot to mention up front that we're gonna show a short five minute video. And Ben uh, Hicks is gonna show this from her end. And uh, the issue that we have is sometimes because of uh, internet speed and things like that, it can be a little bit choppy, but it should still be pretty easy to follow. And um, the narrator and the uh, the person um, the person doing the demonstration of the three-legged compass walk 
are just fantastic. I mean, they should probably be actors, I would think, uh, but they're not. Um, so this is Backyard Family Activity number five. And if you get the book, it's found on page 66. I'll let Jen show that. Do okay. I need to stop sharing? Yeah, go ahead and stop sharing. Okay, here we go. Can everybody hear that? No. 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 Okay. I think I I didn't share it correctly. Let me try it again. Let's see. You might stop sharing and start again. And there's a little button at the bottom that allows you to share the sound as well. Yep. That's what I forgot to do. Okay. We'll start from the beginning. Hello. I'm a Maine Forest Service District Forester, and I would like to introduce the second edition of the popular publication, The Woods in Your Backyard. The original version was printed in 1999 and was very well received by small landowners, educators, and the general public. The current version is set for release this fall, the fall of 2020, and it has been fully updated. The new edition contains a great deal of information about forestry, wildlife, and outdoor recreation. It's in an easy to use format, and it contains a variety of projects and activities that are fun to complete alone or with your family. In short, the woods in your backyard is a great introduction to your piece of the Maine woods. Today, we will demonstrate how to complete one of the activities that's contained within the book. Hello, my name is Nolan, and today we'll be going through the Woods in Your Backyard activity number five, the three-legged compass walk, which can be found on page 66. This activity, you will learn to travel through an area using a triangle-shaped route, and the route will take you back to a starting point. Now also, on page 64, you'll find a very detailed diagram of your compass, and now we're going to start looking at the parts of your compass. Now let's go over the parts of the compass. Right here, we have the base plate. Right here is a movable bezel. Right here is your direction of travel arrow. Right here is a mirror and your sighting notch, but you don't really need those. There are compasses that don't have them. We have one, but you do not need one. And right here is your magnetic needle. And right there is your orienteering arrow. And when you put those together, that means you're putting red in the shed. And that's gonna be very important for when we do our activity. Okay, we're going to start off with our first step, and we're going to set down our marker so we can find our way back to it. And now in our compass, if you'll come in close, we're going to turn our bezel so it, the 40 degree mark is lined up with the direction of travel arrow. And now we're going to turn our bodies so that the red arrow, so that the magnetic needle is within the red arrow, putting red in the shed. And now we're going to walk 10 steps. And that's our first step right there. And now that we're at our second step, we're going to turn our bezel again 120 degrees so that it goes on to 160 degrees lined up with the direction of travel arrow. And now we're going to move our bodies again so that the magnetic needle is placed within the travel arrow. And that way, right is in the shed. And we're going to walk 10 steps. that's our second step. And now that we're at our final step, we're going to turn our bezel again 120 degrees. So our direction of travel arrow is lined up with 280 degrees. And now we're going to place red in the shed again. And we're going to walk another 10 steps while keeping red in the shed. And that's our third step. The intent of this activity was to follow your compass closely. And if you're able to follow your compass closely very well, then you will have ended up back at your starting point. 
just like I ended up back at my tennis ball. Now, if that was too easy, you can make it more challenging by taking as many steps as you want, anywhere from 50 to even 100. Or you can turn the page and look at the four-legged compass walk, which is an additional activity in your book. Now, thank you for watching this demonstration and have a great day. So I'm going to go back to share my screen just to finish off my presentation. Okay, can you see that, Jen? Yep. Okay. So I told you they were uh, Hollywood stars that did that video, and you, you probably understand what I was talking about. Now. All right, let's see if I can get this thing to move ahead. Okay, so we're at the end of the presentation, and this is where I'm going to give you the information you need to get a book. Uh, ideally, uh, if you're a small landowner, you would meet up with a main forest service district forester, uh, walk your woodlot, um, have a chat, get some advice about managing your property and, and what you have, uh, and then you'd get a book at the end. Uh, Usually, when I do uh, what we call a walk and talk and I visit with a landowner, uh, I will give them, if they want it, this book, uh, The Woods in Your Backyard. And a lot of times, if they want it, I'll give them The Forest Trees of Maine. So you get two great publications uh, if you visit with a district forester. Um, the other way is to contact our Augusta office, either at the number that's listed here or you can send an email to the uh, address that's listed under uh, bullet point number two. Uh, you will be allowed to get uh, one free copy sent to you uh, per customer. And I don't know how long that's gonna last, but uh, it's a pretty, pretty good deal at this point. Uh, so I'd take advantage of uh, either option one or two if you're interested. Uh, the other, uh, idea for uh, viewing the publication and reading it is to uh, print or view it off of our publications page on the main forest service website so um, there is a way to get this electronically as well uh, i think in the next slide i'm going to show you a little bit more detail about the woods in your backyard uh, web page okay so there is a woods in your backyard uh, web page uh, the way that you would get to this is go to the main Forest Service website at the address listed here. Uh, you look under the featured projects and click on the woods in your backyard. And you can download the entire book. Uh, I believe, I haven't looked at this web page for a while, but I believe you can download individual chapters. Uh, you can uh, view that fantastic video again on this web page. Uh, and you can uh, get some other additional information from the web page. I think that you may even be able to pick out the activities uh, by themselves if you'd just like to see those. Uh, so the web page is pretty good, and it's a way to get the book electronically. And that's all that I have, and I'd be happy if anybody has any questions, I will try to do my best to answer the question. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I, I have a real quick question and then we'll open it up to anybody wants to ask. Um, do you suspect that um, in the maybe later this year you will have a in person presentation and demonstrate some of the activities for folks who are interested in the uh, in, in what you have to offer? Yeah, so there's a, a lot of things that we'd like to do that I mean, we're just all, all the district foresters are quite busy like everybody else. And um, we initially hope to make a video of all the activities and have those available on the website. And it, it just didn't materialize. And you would think with uh, the state of things with COVID that we would have had some time to do that. It, it just didn't happen. Um, so that's one of the things we'd like to do. Um, I know when we had the original 1999 version of the book, we did some in-person talks regarding the book to promote it. And that's an option, but that's not something that we've discussed much yet. So I can kind of 
put that on my to-do list and see if we can get some somewhere with it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So if anyone has questions, go ahead and unmute yourself. You can turn your video on if you'd like um, and jump in with your question. Is there anybody in this group who has, um, oh, here's a question. How long of a lot is normally needed for something like timber harvest? How, what size of a yes. lot? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a 10 acre wood lot and I've done uh, three light harvests on this property over uh, the past 20 years. So it, it doesn't take much. I mean, to find a logger that will, will do a small job uh, might take some time, uh, but um, I've seen many foresters that have worked with small landowners and uh, helped to do timber sale administration on small woodlots. So I think probably once you get less than 10 acres, it may become a little bit more of a challenge to, to get things to, to happen. But uh, anything's possible. And even with just a few acres, I think that you could make arrangements to do management without much problem. Someone had also on, on the chat said that um, Christine Parrish had also participated in getting the original version of the book together. So we wanted to give her a little. Yeah, I, well. I thought about mentioning that and I completely forgot, but uh, Christine Parrish was the primary author of the original publication. Uh, she was our natural science educator, I believe, back in the late 90s. And it was originally kind of her, her baby, this publication. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've got to give her credit because we did reuse a lot of her material. Here's a question. I'm currently working up a carbon inventory for our wee woods, 2.7 acres in Glenburn. I'd be glad to share the results when I complete the project. So not a question, but some information for that, um, for the person with the question. So Danielle had the question, Roger. Um, and Roger, you can go ahead and um, if you have results, I will send them out to this group. I have everybody's email, so anything. Um, Danielle asked, is Midcoast Maine is at much risk for wildfires now or in the future with climate change? Well, I got to be truthful with you. That is probably a better question for the Forest Protection Division than me. I mean, they're in tune with all the different modeling in regards to uh, wildfire and fuel loads and, and things like that. And I, I feel like I'm probably a little bit underqualified in that area to give you a good answer. So. Um, if I had your contact information, I could put you in touch with someone at Forest Protection to help you out. Yeah, actually, uh, Dan, you'd be open to having people e send you emails with question follow-up questions? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. You're, I'm going to type in your email in the chat. Dan, it's, is it Dan dot? Jacob. Um, Jacobs. Oh, at main.gov, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Give uh, drop a line to Dan for lots of questions, um, including whatever you know connected to this this book. What kinds of precautions are taken to avoid destroying woodland ephemeral wildflowers when timber is harvested? Well, that's a good that's a good question. Um, I think that identifying those areas in advance is is critical. Uh, any areas that you want to have uh, protected. So uh, one of the things that we did yesterday is we had a class on vernal pools. And uh, one of the big things with protecting vernal pools is identifying those on the landscape before you do a harvest. And then you have an opportunity to work around them, uh, make sure that there's adequate shade left and that they're protected. And I, I think that the same reasoning applies to uh, wildflowers and things like that. If, if there's a special feature on your property, whatever it is, uh, locating it, uh, clearly marking it if you want it protected. And then the other thing that we always stress is communication. So if you, uh, as a landowner, uh, want something protected and you're working with a forester and you have a logger, um, 
you want to make sure that your goals and objectives and what you would, your expectations are communicated and that people understand uh, what's expected. So uh, communication is a big part of the puzzle. We, um, one thing that I get from this manual is um, that it's a almost like a passport to your woods. Um, I have been hearing not, you know, no, it was, uh, it's not formally something I have information about, but I've been hearing stories of folks who have woodlands who um, haven't really spent much time in the woods because they have, you know, they're not sure, they, they haven't gotten the guidance or the encouragement to, to do that. They enjoy having, you know, being close to their woods and, and having their homes next to their woods, but haven't been as involved. Um, one thing about the orienteering activity is that one of the issues I've been hearing is some folks feel like they aren't going to be able to get around and back um, in, an, in a timely fashion. And they don't, I guess, in a way, don't want to get lost in their woods. So the orienteering, I thought, was especially interesting to have because it's such a, uh, uh, it's, it's a fundamental skill uh, when it comes to being on land and woods. Do you find, Dan, that you've used that, uh, use an, uh, a compass anymore, or are you pretty much using your uh, GPS to get around on, on lots? Oh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm, I guess I'm just old enough that I still like to do stuff on paper and still like to use a compass and do things a little bit the old fashioned way. A GPS is a great tool and I use it all the time, but uh, sometimes you just have to use a compass. And with this publication, I just want to mention that, that some people are a little bit intimidated by going off in the woods by themselves and uh, thinking they might not be able to make it back home and things like that. And in the first chapter in the book, we start people out gathering information inside of their house uh, so that, you know, they kind of ease into going into their woods little by little until they get to the point where yeah, maybe I'll try and use a compass to to find my way through the woods and get back home again. Uh, but we start off with, with kind of its baby steps. And uh, so if you find that something is a little bit too basic for you or you're already comfortable with it, you might wanna skip ahead a little bit in the book and get this sort of a more advanced area of the book. Um, but we start, we start folks out gathering information close to the house to get them comfortable. Right. I mean, even that the activity um, on in the video was on someone's yard. I mean, a lot of the skills you learn or things you want to do, you can do right in your yard first, and then bring them into the woods once you feel like you've got a grasp on that skill. Exactly, and uh, Terry Coolong's uh, well, she was our district forester out of the Old Town area. She's been promoted since, but uh, she wrote the uh, section of the book uh, about not getting lost, staying found. And she gives a lot of advice, not just um, how to use a compass, but other tips on how to avoid getting lost and, and being able to find your way back home again. Mm -hmm. So Danielle has another question. Danielle, I, I'd invite you to um, unmute yourself and um, go ahead and ask your question if you would like, uh, or unless you would go, go right ahead, please. Sure, yeah. Um... I was just wondering for a brand new um, homeowner, you know, who's buying some woods, um, do you have any kind of top recommendations for things to be aware of or be maintaining right off the bat? You know, like anything that would be immediately kind of a concern for someone who's coming into this sort of ownership? Um, well, one thing that I always recommend that sometimes is hard to get landowners to understand in my district, which is Southern Aroostook County primarily, is there's a lot of value in working with a professional forester. If you get to the point of you want to do some active management, uh, you want to do a timber harvest, you want to manage for wildlife habitat. Um, a lot of times uh, landowners, at least in my district, are concerned about the cost, uh, but having a professional that um, can guide you and do the timber sale administration and help you do wildlife management. Uh, and just the peace of mind that comes with having a professional working for you. Uh, I, I think that's one of the most important things. 
And I always stress that to landowners, uh, whether they're new landowners or they've uh, owned property for a while. But to me, that's a, a key ingredient to success is to work with professionals. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Sure. I'd be curious if anybody in this group has had experience with the first version or the previous version of this Woods in Your Backyard um, manual. Then it sounds like maybe no one. Um, it's great that it's being updated. Probably you didn't, there are probably things that you brought from the old one into the new one. Is that right, Dan? It's not completely, uh, it's not completely different. I mean, it's, you still brought in some of the previous uh, activities and concepts to this new one. Yeah, so as an, ex uh, an example, uh, we have two uh, woodlot examples towards the end of the book. I think they're in chapter six. And what they do is um, they give a description of landowners with different properties, two different landowners, two different properties, and the landowners have different objectives. And uh, the book describes the landowner's objectives, describes the property that they own, and then describes how they went about uh, reaching their objectives and managing to meet their objectives. And they chose different pathways to get to their objectives. One, a pair of landowners decided to kind of do more of, of the work on their own and do a lot of research. And the other landowners decided to connect with the licensed forester and get guidance that way. Um, but those two woodlot examples uh, came across from the original publication. So we did use some of that original material. Roger, would you like to, to jump in here? Uh, you have you have a good. It looks like you've got some. Uh, you you are an extension forester, so if you wanted to weigh in a little bit, let's see. Am I unmuted? There we go. There you go. Yeah, I, uh, I was just wanted to add into the good suggestions made so far that um, it's important. I think that landowners spend some time considering what they value about their woods, what they know about it or what they don't know about it, what their interests are. There's a lot of different facets to that. And that helps to eventually uh, inform the goals and objectives that a landowner may want to employ in the management of their land. But that kind of hmm, what I call self-reflective time, hey, these are my woods. What do we want to do with these? What would we like to see come out of this? I mean, We've got 2.7 acres in Glenburn now. That's not, you know, 2 million acres of timberland, but that's just fine too. And uh, uh, if we can find a low impact harvesting system, we're gonna remove a small number of trees um, to open up some diversity in terms of ages and stages of trees growing in the woods. My wife is very interested in birds. So we're interested in what can we do to create as we might be able to habitat uh, it's suitable for birds. And so, uh, but it takes time. You have to kind of sometimes just go out there in the woods and just be quiet and take it in and think about, hmm, what do I really like here? What really speaks to me about my woods? And, and I think that is, that, that's an important first step that informs a lot of things that come after the fact. Yeah, one thing we like to say is um, and with our organization is that these are your woods and you're the one to make the decisions, you know. Um, and so having some some information, knowing them, knowing what's in them, knowing what you want, you know, get like you're saying, Roger, get kind of into your heart a little bit about what what it is that you're out to do with these woods. Why do you have them asking those kinds of questions? is uh, is really important because when you start bringing other people in to help you make decisions, if you're firm and you're clear about what you want, um, it's going to make it a lot easier to communicate to those who are the resource people to and for you to get what you you want out of your woods. So any, you know, as an organization, any guide that provides that type of insight and helps facilitate that we're all about. So that's what that's what's exciting about this particular manual. 
briefly add that um, in the first chapter of the book, there uh, there is a section, your woodland, your values. And it goes on for several pages, uh, giving ideas about establishing objectives and goals. And uh, it's really a pretty good section. And that's right up front in the book. And I think that's sort of in line with what Roger was talking about is yeah. big, figuring out what you want to do and what you want from your property. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's wonderful. And it's, it's, it's great that it's available to woodland owners. Um, and, and I think the, um, the requirement that you reach out to your district forester to get a copy is a good one because we encourage all of our members, our woodland owners to be, to know who your district forester is and to, and to reach out to them because they're anxious to come see your woods. I know that that's a big part of their job is our walk and talks and going to people's properties and finding out what questions they might have and provide any uh, support they can. And so maybe this is a good way to, another way to facilitate that connection that, um, so as a kind of a reward, you'll, you'll get a, a book. You reach out to your district forester, you ask for a book, you ask for some of their time and, and you're on your way. Yeah, we like we like meeting with landowners because that's the fun part of the job. And you know, there's there's other things we have to do that aren't as fun, but walking somebody's woodlot with them and yeah. seeing what they have and uh, learning about what they're trying to accomplish that's the fun part of the job. So we're we're all about meeting up with small woodland owners. Great. So, what counties, Dan, do you work in? Just in case we have anybody that's in your your region that, um, in case they want to invite you to their land? Yeah, so if there, uh, if you go to the Maine Forest Service website, there's a map that shows where all 10 district foresters are located. And um, I cover primarily Southern Aroostook County, but I also cover a, a little bit of Northern Penobscot, uh, a little bit of Piscataquis and a little bit of Somerset. So my district goes uh, sort of from New Brunswick over to Quebec and it's kind of pie shaped. It's a, it's a kind of a big district and it has uh, a lot of ground that's owned by very large landowners. Uh, the big center for me is Holton and uh, you guys might laugh if you're from the southern part of the state but Holton probably has five or six thousand people and that's the biggest town in my district. Um, so I, most of my business is on the route one corridor. Um, between like, uh, say, Danforth and the Presque Isle area. But uh, anybody, I mean, you don't have to be in my district to send me an email. Uh, but okay. if you, and then if you want to go for a walk, I would just connect you with a district forester that is uh, covers your area. Great. Well, thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate your time and everybody's effort putting this book together. We will have, we actually have a link on our website, um, on our events page, where you can click to the website that um, has the information about the, uh, the, the book and also a link to the PDF. And then uh, information about, again, how you reach out to, I mean, Dan would be the person you could reach out to and, and get set up to receive a copy. Um, and then there's, there's other, the district foresters in your area that you could reach out to, so. Um, if you have any other questions, drop Dan a line, send me an email. Uh, we wanna keep the conversation going. We really appreciate everyone being here today and we hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. And we hope to see you at our next events. Next week, we have You Just Bought Woods, Now What? With Tom Doak and Jeff Williams talking to new woodland owners who would like to get a, uh, some ideas about what, where they need to start um, in their journey of, as woodland owners. And then we also have a TikTok at the end of the month on the 25th of May. So check our events page and sign up for more of our uh, programs. Thank you, everyone, and we'll hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you,